Um, with that, we are prepared as much as we can. We have some highly trained individuals. Um, you talk about the disciplines of the technical rescue and hazmat. All Charleston fire and police vehicles have radiation detectors in them. They're going anytime the vehicles are on the streets. Um, you talk about the radiation. There's two to four micrograms uh, or milla rads in the background just driving around towns now. Okay. So it's out there. But we're prepared as much as we can be. Um, with the Mavis, though, we can call in resources. We have actually, uh, potentially four states at our hand. With one phone call, I can request whatever resources I need with one phone call. They will deploy them and have them here within a few hours. Okay. Great, great answer. Good, very complete answer. What I'd like to do is take a short break. Um, we've talked a little bit about how it all started in Japan. There's be, there are other areas that we may have to consider that are a little closer to us than Japan and the effects of if something happened there, what would, we, what would we really be ready for all of this? So I want to take a short break and we'll be right back with questions from the audience and continue our discussion on the nuclear reaction and safety of Illinois. Okay, great, thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I wanted to ask uh, one quick question before, before we go to the audience. When we talk about nuclear safety, I wanted to ask, how was it outlined, basically? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Please? Sure. Yeah, the Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety has actually been around for several decades, and it was beefed up significantly following the Three Mile Island incident, because those types of questions, the questions that we're asking right now, those are questions that were raised at that time. Okay. And there was a significant investment made by the state of Illinois to really develop what is now really the premier nuclear safety program in the country. Okay. So we have several systems that are actually unique to Illinois that no one else actually has. One of them is called our resident inspector program, where our department actually has third party independent radiological inspectors that actually work at each of these plants. Mm -hmm. So we actually have a triple redundant system. The company that owns them, Exelon, they have their own resident inspectors. The NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they have them. But what's unique to Illinois is we actually have a third tier of inspectors that actually work for IEMA and conduct inspections at those yeah. plants. We also have something called the remote monitoring system. We take uh, data from more than a thousand sensors in each side of it in each of the plants mm -hmm. and we can actually co collect and interpret all of that data in real time so we will actually know if there's an incident inside the plant before the company actually knows it and all of this is centered around a, a program called REAC which is actual physical location in the state emergency operations center that collects all this data 24 hours a day seven days a week in real time and actually represents it graphically for our our personnel and the last thing is an actual Part of the remote monitoring system is uh, gaseous detectors that are actually surrounding each of the power plants. Okay. So at a radius of two miles around each of the plants, uh -huh. they collect 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They collect data so we can actually tell if there is a radiological leak or a leak of radiation from any of the plants. We can tell which direction it's going, how significant it is, what types of isotopes we're looking at, which is very unique. There's no one else in the country that has that. Great points, good to know, good to know. And also, I think it's important for us to mention that Exelon is uh, the owner of these uh, that's right. reactors, correct? That's right. All of them, so I think that's important in, in, in your, in your um, narrative there. Thank you so much. We're going to take a, a question from the audience or a statement, and sir, if you would step straight to the mic and pull the mic down a little bit so we can hear what you're saying. That's great, I thank you. I just it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm Alan, I'm Alan Baholo. I'm a geochemist. First of all, yes, New Madrid moved 200 years ago. And because of that, the tension building around it. And we had many small. Any time, it's just moved like San Andreas any fault. And that would be devastating shock travel. So it's, it's there any moment. Two, all this nuclear waste that we have has Steve knows plutonium, and plutonium radiate alpha, and alpha penetrate anything. You need only one atom. Goes to the body, goes to the membrane of the cell, goes to the nucleus, damage regulatory gene. The regulatory gene goes berserk, and that's what cancer is. So it's not like solar radiation, radiation from your lamp. Steve knows, highly penetrating. Only need one atom. 
You cannot see it. You cannot taste it. You cannot smell it. And all the nu nuclear waste, which is now a store or nuclear power plant in the pool, we don't know where to take them, where to dispose them. There is a place, Yucca Mountain, supposedly. If that ever happens, all these waste travel through American highways from east to west. All you need, one accident. Okay. So, in other words, and the fourth, airplane could crash in any of these nuclear power plants. So, I don't want us to be pessimistic, but I finish my statement. When Einstein discovered E is equal MC2, that is statement he said, unleash power of the atom has changed everything, mm -hmm. except our way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Thus we okay. drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. Okay, thank you, sir. So, Can Dr. Daniels, absolutely, <laughs> you were called out by name. We're gonna yes. let you respond to that. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, there are three, three main types of radiation that we consider. There's alpha, beta, and gamma. Mm -hmm. The alpha particle is basically uh, helium and with high energy. The beta particle is basically an electron, and the gamma particle is a photon with high energy. The alpha particles will basically be stopped by a piece of paper. Because they are so massive and so large, uh, they're, ve they're very easy to stop. However, if they get inside your body, they get stopped by your body, and therefore they, they can do significant damage that way. So it's when you ingest uh, alpha, particle, or alpha emitters that that can have the most damage there. The beta emitters uh, can go a few centimeters, a few tenths of a centimeter, so they would go inside your skin. They can actually start to harm your body, but it's the gammas that actually go through you and, and, and can uh, impact deep tissue. Now, okay, I'm not a physicist or, <laughs> or <laughs> any of those physicists. Um, I just wanted to ask, though, um, is that one of the reasons why our first point of attack or defense was in the air, in the water supply, in the plants, things that we can ingest? Is that why we've been looking and monitoring that particular, those particular elements every six months, as you say? I mean, with that? Absolutely. I mean, that? really, that's the, the best way to tell. And a lot of times, and you can certainly uh, expand on this quite a bit, there's there can be significant inconsistencies just in areas of the state, northern Illinois versus southern Illinois. It's a, it's a large geographic area, so when we take air samples from northern Illinois and air samples from southern Illinois or uh, grass samples, we also do milk, we do fish, we do water, all of these types of things. We test them on a regular basis. This is something we did long before anything happened in Japan. But that's why you have to test all areas of the state because there are a lot of environmental factors that could actually cause certain things to go to certain places where you wouldn't see it. Okay. But that's exactly why we test it, because that's, you, it's the air you breathe, it's the grass you walk on, it's the fish that you eat, it's the milk that you drink. Those are the types of things that we need to be able to check. Okay, well, um, let me ask this then from um, an environmental uh, point of view then, because one of the things that we haven't been able con to control, one of the things we haven't been able to say, this is what we have in place and this is how we can measure, are the elements that can actually drive up these levels, such as the wind, the water, the river. I mean, I, I mean, I, maybe I'm looking at it a little differently, but I have to ask, I'm looking at it critically now, and I have to ask questions since we're, um, we're sitting on the, uh, on the Muhammad Aquifer, right? Okay, uh, uh, Aquifer, the largest body of fresh water in the country. Could any release reach that source of water, and what would be the effect? That's if, 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 yeah, if you, if okay. you have a meltdown, it's definitely going to cause a serious issue. If you have a leak in the suppression containment, right, then it gets into the water system and then we're all drinking it. Okay. And so, and then, but it's not just us that, that uh, is going to be impacted, it's going to be the, uh, all vegetation uh, from the ground level. Okay. Atmospherically, mm -hmm. you have heat that's billowing should a disaster occur, and then what happens is all, we're, we're surrounded by winds. And so we get Absolutely. A, a, like tomorrow we've got with flat, you know, uh, flat, flat, and, and lots so, of winds. Yeah. And so that is, all that radiation would transfer quickly, especially with storms. And so that radiation mm -hmm. gets into the clouds. You have a huge storm system that that it, that naturally occurs, but then it starts dumping the, the precipitation back into the soil, and so contaminating it doubly. 
So that's my concern. When you say that, and, and we're, we're looking at a flat terrain here, and, and, and we can't really control the wind. So then, therefore, I'm looking at, um, if that's the case, are we prepared or are we, do we have filters in place of some sort? Or how are we preparing or protecting the ourselves? The big question is, is okay. how, much, how much education has there been, been in, 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 to educate the community? Okay. That's the big question. I, I haven't heard anything. I didn't even know that uh, Illinois had nuclear power plants until Fukushima.